So one of the things I found really fascinating is that there, the depression is more broad than we think, that there are actually a couple different ways to define it. And, um, you know, in my kind of research around this um, for our preparation, um, theologically, uh, theologians have talked about depression, um, something called spiritual depression, and um, something that St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul where um, it's almost an expectation that every Christian will kind of go through this uh, dark valley or this this place and the purpose of it is actually to get closer to God, to, mm -hmm. to grow more intimate with God mm -hmm. and that the purpose of it is really to kind of remove the superficialities of faith, to, mm -hmm. to move from this kind of performance-based uh, mentality where I have to perform and do these things for God and move to a place where you understand that that you're known by God and, and God loves you um, that creates such a deeper more dynamic uh, relationship with God but that's a spiritual depression and that's not actually the only way it can be defined um, and so I think it's important for um, us to understand the, the psychological, clinical way of viewing depression as well. Sure, and, and you know, that makes a lot of sense in the, the way that I think people now more broadly use the word depression just to convey a whole host of different things. You know, when we work with kids, we'll often hear, oh, the, that was so depressing, or I'm so depressed. And really, you know, I most of the time when they say that, they're talking about feeling really stressed or, or transiently more distrust. But when we talk about clinical depression, first of all, it's a medical illness. And I think it's important to think about that in that there are true chemical changes that are occurring for a person that significantly impact the way they feel, the way they act, um, the way they engage with themselves and the world. Um, and the symptoms are really some that interfere with functioning and I think for kids and for youth interfere with their normal paths of development and so while symptoms of depression might manifest differently I think at its core some of the important symptoms to think about are things like a sense of hopelessness mm -hmm. so you know why am I even going to bother doing this nothing's going to get better nothing's going to change um, you might see a sense of becoming isolated or withdrawn from others. Um, a feeling of not being able to really engage or enjoy anything. So a lot of things that I hear that make my ear kind of perk up is, this is so boring, or that's stupid, I don't want to do that, this is boring. And it's not that the activity itself is boring, it's more that I can't find any enjoyment in mm -hmm. what's going on. You know, from a, a body perspective, um, people who struggle with depression truly have a lower threshold for pain. So you do see a lot of headaches and stomach aches, particularly for youth, you know, mm -hmm. feeling exhausted or just completely drained from an energy perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, feeling guilty about things, feeling like they have no agency. And the combination of those symptoms really gets in the way of how they function at school, how they function at home, how they function with their peers. And, and it's something that we need to think about. You know, um, it's not this notion of, well, they're just being teenagers and, you know, they're being hormonal or it's, mm -hmm. it's a rite of passage mm -hmm. also of adolescence. Actually, that sense of pain or irritability or anguish that comes with depression is not a normal part of adolescence. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when you're talking about clinical depression across contexts with different levels of severity from mild to severe, we've all heard a lot of myths mm -hmm. that um, unfortunately a lot of people believe, um, either believe culturally or believe because they've never been taught um, an alternative to those myths. Um, I know one, for example, I'm thinking about is that depressed kids or grown-ups can't get out of bed and all they do is cry all day. Mm. And that mm. is true for some people, but that's not, that doesn't encompass all of the different ways that depression can manifest. And you can see a kid who has depression laugh 
or have moments where they feel okay. Mm -hmm. And they may even be able to function in certain domains of their life. Um, What are some of the other myths that that you've heard of uh, surrounding depression and suicide? Okay, so I'll talk from a theological perspective. Um, One is Christians are always supposed to be happy. Mm -hmm. And um, what ends up happening is if someone doesn't feel happy, then they feel guilty about it, mm-hmm. and they, mm-hmm. they don't seek help. Mm-hmm. And the, the problem with that myth is it's not true. Right. If you look in the Bible, um, there are so many uh, people, uh, David, who said that darkness is my closest friend. Mm-hmm. You have people like Elijah and Jonah who actually probably, uh, you would say, had suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're sitting there talking about, you know, I don't want to live. Um And so you have all of these, you know, uh, people in the Bible that have experienced depression that um, is clear that, you know, you don't have to be alone, that they don't have to feel alone, that this is this is a common, you know, that that this has happened before Mm -hmm. that is, you know. um, And so I think that that's a myth that that Christians ought to be happy. It's, Mm -hmm. It's not always true. You know, one, uh, a couple of things that we hear quite often is if you talk about depression, but especially if you talk about suicide, you're going to be putting ideas in people's head. Mm. Um, and it's really important to realize that the research supports that actually open communication is so important for people who are struggling. So when people contemplate suicide, it's not that they have made a decision that they don't want to live anymore they're actually really ambivalent about death. They're more in such pain that they can't find another way Mm -hmm. to end the hurt that they're feeling. And so being able to communicate with someone and tolerate that level of distress with someone and hold that space with them is really incredibly important. And when we educate youth ministers, when we educate youth and we tell them, about what the signs of depression are, what some of the symptoms um, might look like in people their age, what suicidal thoughts might sound like. We're not making them suicidal, but we're actually educating them and giving them information that will really help them understand perhaps what they're going through or what somebody else is going through um, should they ever get to that point. And I think sometimes, especially kids who are uh, socially saying things like, oh, I'm so depressed, or that was so depressing, or even making suicidal statements like, oh, I'm just going to kill myself today, um, their response to them is often, just get over it. Mm -hmm. You're being dramatic. Mm -hmm. You are just looking for attention. And we know, as you said, that depression is a biological illness. It is not something that people can just get over. It is not something that they want. Um, it There are cognitive and physical and emotional symptoms that are very real. And they they can be treated and they can be helped, but they can't just be willed away. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely Or prayed true. away. Or Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And which can, which can be another myth mm-hmm. in the Christian community that, you know, certain things could just be prayed away. And we do need to use prayer as a practice of faith to help, you know, in various ways. But that can also be coupled with some real therapeutic treatment mm-hmm. when needed, you know. And so um, just the taboo nature of not seeking treatment and thinking that, you can kind of do this alone through prayer is not always the best response Mm -hmm. or a healthy Mm -hmm. response. And, you know, that makes me think of um, another myth that's really prevalent is that something really bad has to happen in order Mm -hmm. for someone to become depressed. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually, we know that it, it's not depression is not brought about by just one catastrophic event that happens. Certainly, you know, if those events occur, it can have a, a meaningful impact on someone. But you know, kids of all backgrounds, regardless of what kind of resources they have or don't, 
regardless of what might be going on for them, they might still develop depression. And I think it would be really hard to say, well, what do you have to be depressed about? There's nothing yeah, going on. Right. Or you have so much. Why are you depressed? Right? Um, and I think it's important for us to really remember those are not helpful um, understandings of why someone might become depressed. Those are not helpful responses. But I think really just being curious with someone and respectful and understanding what's going on for them rather than rushing to problem solving mm -hmm. or finding an immediate reason is the most important initial first step to take. Mm -hmm.